Religion has always been a part of Detroit. The first church was founded in 1701 at the same time the city itself was. In the same way that schools were built to accommodate the rising population of the 1900s, churches too sprung up in the neighborhoods in a continual effort to match their growing parishes. So too, like the schools, the churches of Detroit found themselves losing their parishioners rapidly during the 1960s and 1970s. Each service, the offering plates were coming back with less and less, not only because fewer people were attending, but also because many of those that stayed had a lower income. Because of this, abandoned churches scatter the city landscape. In this episode, we will be looking at a cross-section of a few of these from some of the most well-known to some forgotten. We begin at perhaps one of the most iconic abandoned churches to be photographed. Often referred to as St. Kirby, this Presbyterian church built in 1911 has been on the National Register of Historic Places since 1982. A decade after it opened, there were over 2,200 members in attendance. During this time, I found it noted that one of the members of the church was W.O. Stoddard Jr., whose father had been secretary to Abraham Lincoln. But by 1961, attendance had dropped to less than 1,000, with white flight to the suburbs driving out attendees in droves. They opened a second branch in the suburbs for those members, but when the remaining congregation voted to stay in the city, the church would annex to become its own. However, following the Detroit riots of 1967, by the following decade, just 404 members remained here. Services at that time were noted as remaining very traditional, which meant they did not draw in the African-American crowds who were quickly becoming the predominant presence in Detroit at the time. In the early 80s, they would merge with another church, but the numbers continued to drop with just 210 members by 1991. In 1993, as an effort to draw more people in, they left the Presbyterian Church to welcome all denominations of Christianity to attend. There were two funerals of note that occurred at the church, First was one for six Metro Detroit victims of the Korean Airlines Flight 007 that was shot down by the Soviet Union in 1983 after it mistakenly flew into prohibited Soviet airspace. A visitation for the 36th District Court Chief Judge Longworth Quinn was held here in 1990 after he took his own life. After the pastor died in 2005, the church was closed permanently. The following year saw the building change hands several times with plans to renovate it, but the costs were too high. Hollywood, however, did find the decaying building appealing, and scenes for the films Alex Cross and Transformers 5 were filmed inside. Finally, in 2016, an IT company purchased a property and the adjacent building with intentions to renovate both. The following years saw the building inaccessible from scrappers and explorers as they replaced the roof and began cleaning the inside out. But then in 2019, the company was caught bribing a city official for business contracts and were barred from doing any business in Detroit for a decade. This church on the west side of the city would first be founded in a residential house's basement in 1920 before a small church was built the following year. The current building would open in 1926 as a Methodist Episcopal Church. The connected community house was constructed in 1926 that featured a gym, classrooms, and kitchen. By 1974, another church would close and the congregation migrated to this one. Three years later, they too would need to close and join with another church. A missionary Baptist church would then purchase it and use the structure until 1995 before selling to the final church. Pastor's offices, I guess, or schooling? Uh, 
just like a, another meeting hall. Oh, but there's a cross over there. Check this out. Cornerstone Technology Center. Obviously cleared out. Just a small little chapel. Oh, that's a nice piano. Three pianos. Here's a little Palm Sunday thing still here too. That's a little the Lord's Prayer glass. I don't really know what it's called. Here's the safe. It's still sealed. Of course somebody tried to break in. Oh, this is like probably the teen center. It just has that vibe. <laughs> I'm sure somebody's been here recently, man. Cross in the tile work out here. In 2002, the church saw over 300 people attend the funeral of a seven-year-old girl who died in a drive-by shooting in front of her home. In 2013, they too would choose to relocate to a more modern building, and this one has remained vacant ever since. But not every church in the city was a cathedral. In the city's rapid-growing years, Hundreds of small congregations popped up on almost every city block. One such was Craig's Chapel, built in 1923 as a branch of the Central Savings Bank and designed by famous Detroit architect Albert Kahn. It would be used as a diner and pool hall before becoming Craig's Chapel Baptist in 1973 and operating until 1999. All right. It does look just like a diner. You gotta get your mommy cracker. Yeah. Oh, there's some dead rats. There's dead rats? Oh, yeah. Where? Oh. Nice. This grand brick building began construction in 1908 as a church and community center. Yeah, the floor is in uh, not the best shape here. In just three years of opening, the congregation had grown to roughly 600. In the 1920s, it changed to its current name, and a second building featuring a gymnasium and classrooms were constructed. It was in this gym in 1940 that the pastor, at the time, sustained head and spinal injuries during a basketball game, but planned to take just two months' recovery time off before returning to give sermons. In 1929, it was reported that thieves broke inside one night, drilling a hole in the safe, and made off with $400 of Sunday donation money. Very yellow. In 1936, East Grand Boulevard was set to be widened, and a plan was made to lift the church off its foundation and move it further back so that the building would be conjoined with the gym and be saved from demolition. In 1947, Sherman Price, the janitor at the church, would be found in his home next to his dead wife. He would confess that he had stabbed her to death before plunging the knife into his own throat due to the unpardonable sin of lack of faith. Family would say that he complained of the church having had too many wedding ceremonies recently and he had become irritable.
he would be found not guilty by reason of insanity and sentenced to the state hospital for life. But after a court commission found him sane, a judge would order him released the following year, meaning he literally got away with murder. In 1961, African American man was voted to become the associate pastor of the church, making him, quote, the first Negro minister appointed to a white Methodist church in the city. And articles at that time note the church as being the most liberal and the Methodist denomination in the area. The church would close in 1985, at which time it would become the second Unity Full Gospel Baptist Church, which closed in the year 2000 and has remained abandoned ever since. The final location we will be visiting is this former Episcopal church. It got its start back in 1897 when parents became worried about sending their children across the busy railroad tracks to go to Sunday school and a second branch opened that same year. Five years later, a mission chapel was added to the school and it would continue to grow, adding the parish house in 1916 after two members of the church placed the deed to that parcel in the offering plate a few years prior. Over 1,000 members began to attend, and in 1926, the current church would be constructed. They continued to grow to over 2,000 members, making it at one time the largest Episcopal church in the city until, like the other churches we've covered, white flight led to it finally closing in 1978. In 1981, it would reopen as a newly formed missionary Baptist church by a reverend of another church who was thrown out by an angry congregation that had a judge order him to stay off their premises. What happened was the reverend was substituting for that church's regular reverend, C.L. Franklin, who was the father of Aretha Franklin. However, when it was discovered that he had attempted to get Franklin listed as retired, he was thrown out to form this church, bringing a sizable portion of his former congregation with him. He would remain here until his death in 2011. The church continued to operate until closing in 2016. Oh, here they got even a sign that says caution, floor is weak. What's over there? It's like a school classroom. There's like a bunch of lockers and of course two pianos. Somehow this light it's still on. Here we go up into the bell tower. Of course, it's a rickety old wooden ladder. Today, it is reported that only 42.2% of people in Detroit would identify themselves as religious. Over the past decade, the Catholic Archdiocese has had to downsize a total of three times in less than 15 years. While some of these once palatial houses of worship have been saved, there is an exponential number more that are still left decaying. Thank you.